Hello everyone. I can barely believe I'm here doing another video after so many years. My videos on how to compose a symphony were a project for the COVID lockdown when I had more time than I knew what to do with. Then I got a lot more busy and, and had to put the music tutorials behind me. But in the back of my mind, I felt like I'd left something unfinished. After writing an entire classical symphony for you, all four movements, and showing you step by step how to do it, I then wrote a sketch of the first movement of a romantic symphony. I laid out for you how to organize it and how the romantic symphonic spirit was really different from the classical spirit, but I never orchestrated that sketch. So here I am finally finishing up unfinished work I want to show you the orchestration for that piece. The Romantic Orchestra is bigger, more lush, more sonorous than the Classical Orchestra, but in its fundamentals it's not all that different. What you see here is the full orchestration. In my previous videos I composed and orchestrated on the spot in front of you so we could walk through the journey together, and I think that's better. But this time I got ahead of myself and orchestrated the whole thing already as a way of motivating myself to get back into these tutorial videos. So I'm going to show you an already complete orchestration and explain it. If you want to see how the initial sketch of the movement was composed, check out the previous video. Here's the orchestra. It's fairly standard for the early Romantic period. In fact, it's identical to the instrumentation for Schubert's Eighth. I've been told that my orchestration tends to have a Schubertian flavor. Here, I'm trying to show you how to write in a romantic style, how the symphony expanded and changed from its origins in the classical period to its real heyday in the romantic period. The woodwind section contains two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, and two bassoons. This is the standard woodwind set. Two of each seems to have enough power to hold its own in the larger orchestra. In later Romantic music, as the orchestra grew and became massive, sometimes you see the woodwinds in threes instead of twos. And then, of course, you can have specialty instruments for color. A uh, piccolo is common to get that very brilliant high flute sound. An English horn is common to give you a singing tenor oboe for the heartfelt melodies. A bass clarinet is one of my favorite instruments. It has a strong, vibrant, amazing sound. And a contrabassoon can hit those really low, powerful notes that sound like moose farts. These extensions and added colors were present even at the start of the Romantic period. They are relatively common throughout. But I'm leaving them all out here. The reason is that I want to show you the most basic standard orchestra without the extra bells and whistles. Now we reach the brass section. I have two horns. This is actually very unusual. With a big romantic orchestra, four horns would be more common. The horns form a sonic core, a power cell at the heart of the music. Whether the music's loud or quiet, the horns can play a role in blending and resonating and creating atmosphere. But especially when they take on the role of loud, blasting music, aligning themselves with the trumpets and the trombones, then four horns are really the recommended minimum. If you want huge, dramatic music, you may want eight horns. That would be a wall of sound to knock you back off your seat. So why do I have only two horns? Two reasons. First, I decided to copy exactly the instrumentation from Schubert's Eighth Symphony. It worked for him. It can work for us. He tended to use the trombones to fill some of the more usual horn roles. Second, if I added another staff line for two more horns, I'd have to shrink the score to fit it on the video, and the notes would get so small you would have trouble seeing anything. So I decided to make do with two horns. I have two trumpets. This is standard. In a very big orchestra, trumpets sometimes come in threes, and some composers like to use two sets of threes. I've done that before, and it works if you want a very brass-heavy feel to the piece. I have three trombones. This is almost universal. 
somehow that combination is properly weighted against the rest of the orchestra. Typically, the alto and tenor parts would go on one staff line and the bass part on a separate staff line. But again, I'm trying not to make the score so large that I have to shrink it to illegibility just to fit it in the video, so I'm cheating a little by putting all three trombone parts on one staff. A romantic brass section can also have a true bass trombone, which is a separate instrument of its own. It can also have a soprano trumpet, sometimes called a piccolo trumpet, and a bass horn, which is a beautiful instrument. And it can have a tuba, and, well, that's probably the main set of common brass instruments. Here, I'm including only the essential core. I have a timpani. Romantic orchestras can also have a giant set of additional percussion instruments, including a bass drum, which has no pitch but makes a huge earthquake-like boom, a tam or gong, cymbals, snare drum, wood blocks, bells, harp, celeste, xylophone, piano, not for a concerto, but just for background orchestral color. Amazing, wonderful sounds come out of the percussion section, like the cannons in Tchaikovsky's 1812 overture. But here, alas, for the sake of a tutorial, I am stripping it down to the essentials, just the timpani. And now we have the standard string section, which has the same organization as for the classical symphony. String sections have remained the same for hundreds of years. A set of first violins, a set of second violins, a set of violas, a set of cellos, and a set of string basses. Now that we have our instrumentation, I want to walk you through the first six measures, the introduction. This movement has a slow introduction. The first violins carry the melody, and it sounds like this. When writing a sketch, this is pretty much what you produce, a single thread running through the entire movement so that you can get all the proportions and the flow. Now, how do you orchestrate a melodic line like that? The answer is layer by layer. I made the first violins, second violins, and violas work together as a unit. This is simple three-part harmony. I'm not going to give a tutorial on harmony here. I'll assume you already know it. Or if you don't, it won't actually make any difference in understanding the orchestration. Here's the harmonized version of the melody. The next layer, the next musical thought, is some added oomph from the cellos and string basses. They add a little bit of counter melody, nothing elaborate, just the feel of some added sonority coming in. And the cellos and basses, of course, work together. They give you that nice, strong bass sound. In a standard romantic symphony, just as with a classical symphony, the bulk of it is the string section. You're writing a piece for string orchestra and adding color and resonance and power from the other instruments. That's not universally true. There can be parts where the strings fall silent and other instruments take over, but those are the exceptions. The simplest way to begin orchestration is to do as I've done here, write for the strings first then add the other instruments. And if along the way you decide to drop some of the strings in favor of some other instrument sounds, you can do that. It's tempting to pile on a lot of complicated instrument sounds, 
but good orchestration is often about stripping things down to the simplest. Here, all I'm doing is adding color with these sustained notes. If you listen just to the horns, they sound like this. And notice that when I want to keep the same note but change the register, going down an octave, I don't just move every horn note down in tandem. The change becomes a little more noticeable to the ears by making the second note doubled. Two horns on one note will have a little more oomph, so that moment of change from the higher register to the lower register stands out a little bit more. I've also added this flute and clarinet combo. There is something very beautiful and very useful about the clarinet doubled an octave higher by the flute. I think you'll see that combo come back over and over throughout the piece. And this is a good example of how the horns often function as woodwinds. Horns are very versatile. They can resonate with the heavy brass or with the woodwinds, or with the strings, and they can have a voice of their own. Here they play a quiet background role with the woodwinds. Together, they sound like this. And I want you to notice something. Even though these notes are for background color, they still have a rhythmic presence. Each sustained note has a distinct onset and offset, and you want to make sure those moments come at the right time. For me, it felt right for them to start on the second beat of the measure, not the first. And here they end on the third beat, not the final beat. It gives a tiny bit of offbeat emphasis. As I said, it can be tempting to pile on sounds on top of sounds, but sometimes it's good to let the strings work on their own as in these measures. And finally, the horns return here, resonating in the background to help fill in the gaps, the rests between notes, and also to smooth over that transition from the introduction to the main body of the movement. Here, the sound of the horns, just plain horns, seemed right to me. In the end, orchestration is really just deciding which sound seems right to you. It's ultimately subjective. Here's the full introduction with its very light but carefully considered orchestration leading into the main movement. In the next video, I'll continue with the movement. It may take us a fair few videos, but I want to explain the orchestration thoroughly. Thank you all for watching.